Hello and welcome to the analyst where we bring to you detailed UPSC oriented discussion on important current affair articles from Hindu and Indian Express. Today is 10th of March and we have picked up the following 5 articles that are as follows. First of all, we'll understand the basics of genome sequencing and analyze why it's high time for India to make regulations on the same. Then, as our election commissioner has recently resigned from the post ahead of the election, we learn about the election commission of India and the challenges faced by it. Then, as India witnesses rapid privatization of space sector, we'll thoroughly analyze its potential, challenges and advantages. Then from prelims point of view, we'll be covering two articles. In the first one, we'll be covering an important place in news, which is the Kaziranga National Park recently visited by our Prime Minister and an important species in news, which is the Golden Langur. On this note, let's get started. Our first topic is a very interesting one. Here we will have a detailed study of genomics, the biology part of it, and also understand the context as to why there is an urgent need from India's side to have a strong legal framework for genomics in India. So first of all, to begin with, what is genomics? Now, genomics is that branch of biology that particularly deals with the study of genome. So then what is a genome? Genome is a complete set of DNA information inside an organism. So what is genome? Genome is something which actually carries your entire genetic address or entire genetic address of any organism. So it contains of all the DNA that is present or a set of DNA that is present inside the body. This is known as genome. Now. When I'm talking about DNA, what is DNA? DNA is that hereditary material which is present inside the nucleus of each cell of the organism which consists of, which consists of all the genetic information that is required for building and maintaining the body which means the way you will be building your nose, eyes, kidneys, livers or in fact any disease as well as well as how you will be maintaining an organism or how the body will be maintaining its own functions that all of that is determined by this genetic information or this code that is inherently available in each organism and this is inherited from our ancestors so this is a hereditary information which is contained in what in the DNAs where are DNAs present in the body DNAs are present essentially in two parts first of all in chromosomes DNA is present in chromosome which is present inside the nucleus. Nucleus which is the central part of a cell. And also it is present in minute amount in the mitochondria. So it is not just in the nucleus where we will find DNAs or the chromosomes. Because DNA is comprised in chromosomes. But it is also found in some quantity in the mitochondria. And this is we are talking about the eukaryotic cells. So now do you understand what is genomics? What is a genome and what is DNA and where is it present? Now, when I want to have a detailed sequencing of this DNA in order to understand the entire DNA setup inside an organism, I will be conducting a process which is known as genome sequencing. Let me elaborate that on more by first of all telling you the difference between DNA and another term associated with it which is RNA, the ribonucleic acid. DNA or the deoxyribonucleic acid is a double helix structure first of all but the single helix structure is RNA. Now what happens is your entire genetic makeup is basically wound up around chromosome. Can you see this is one chromosome inside the body and there are 22 pairs of chromosomes. Now when there is this chromosome it can be unwounded or unwinded into multiple forms of million strands of DNA structures. Now these DNA structures are so long, so lengthy that it's not possible to directly translate them into protein right away. We know that the objective of this DNA makeup or this genetic information is to carry out certain maintenance functions and development functions in the body. What is responsible for developing a body? Protein synthesis. And where is this protein synthesized in the body? In another cell organelle which is known as ribosome. So how does, how is it possible that this entire genetic information can come out of the nucleus and then it reaches the ribosome? It is not technically possible. So then what is required? We require copy of a particular desired segment of this entire DNA 
the copy which will be able to carry a small part of the genetic information whichever is desired let's say body wants to create kidneys now for that a specific part a specific snapshot of the kidney makeup of the body should be taken up in the form of rna this function is performed by rna so what it does it carries specific copy of a particular desired gene and carries it to ribosome where it will be translated into some or the other body parts or some or the other body function so here is where the protein synthesis will happen and who is going to be the mediator between dna and protein synthesis it is the rna so do you understand what is the difference between dna rna both of them are hereditary materials but having some of the intrinsic differences let's also understand the difference in detail see any dna is composed of nucleotides it is made up of multiple nucleotides which are broadly sugars and phosphate groups and nitrogenous base the difference in these three actually creates differences between these two hereditary materials that is dna and rna as you can see there is difference in structure as well dna is a double helix structure and rna is a single strand or single helix structure that's the first thing second thing there is difference in the sugar as well in the case of dna we have got we have got hydrogen group therefore this is deoxyribose sugar whereas on the other hand rna has got the hydroxyl group which means it is and it is a ribose sugar there is a difference in the sugar then coming to difference in the nitrogenous bases or their or their nucleobases or their nucleotides now this is where you will find that there are probably there are, there are a total uh, four nucleotides present in a dna which is adenine guanine cytosine and thymine this is for a dna but in the case of rna you will find that there the thymine is missing and instead of it it is replaced by uracil so the bond is created between a and u and in the case of dna it is created between adenine and thymine so these are some of the differences between rna and dna in your widespread viruses like covid you will be only seeing rnas and not dna but in the full fledged eukaryotic organisms you will be seeing dnas okay along with rnas which have their own function as i have already told you to basically transform and carry the genetic material and take it to the ribosome so that enough amount of protein can be synthesized so that the genetic information can be translated into reality i hope this is clear to you so we have understood about we have understood about genome rna and dna now how does this process takes place and what are the different terminologies given to it which is also asked in the upsc the two terms that i want to teach over here are transcription and the process of translation see now what happens i've already told you that there needs to be a creation of copy let's see let's say that this is a dna sequence and out of which i have to snapshot i have to create a copy of only this much segment of the dna i have to carry only take up only this much information for that i will be creating i will be creating a duplicate copy of it because i cannot carry this material i cannot obstruct the dna i can only create a copy the process of creation of copy of this dna into rna is known as the process of transcription you are transcripting the language you are converting it from dna to rna now this rna molecule newly converted out of the process of transcription which is responsible for carrying this this code this genetic code and it acts as basically a messenger right that it carries this code towards the ribosome therefore this rna is known as messenger rna there are multiple types of rna in the body there is messenger rna then there is transfer rna now what happens because it is going to the ribosome ribosome which is responsible for protein synthesis how will it be able to create protein if it doesn't have adequate amount of amino acids coming from the body so what is responsible for providing a chain of or the desired amount of amino acids into the body do you know that amino acid is the monomer of protein so these are basically the building blocks of protein so who brings this chain of amino acid from the body from the nutrients of the body towards the ribosome so that it can create it can translate this particular genetic code into some body material or some body process it is the transfer rna 
then there is another form of RNA which is ribosomal RNA which is basically responsible for building the ribosomes, carrying the genetic material to the ribosomes. So these are the three types of RNA I have explained. Now we understand that whenever this genetic code is translated into some body development or some body's organ, tissue, cell or function, that process is known as translation. So now are you getting that there are two processes, one is transcript transcription and the another one is translation. Which one happens before? Word with capital, word with C. Transcription happens before as compared to translation. S comes later. So in this manner, you can also understand which process takes place first. So transcription happens first, then happens translation. So I hope all of this understanding of genomics is clear to you. Now one more word that I want you to understand is transcriptome. Now can you break up because this question was asked in UPSC prelims 2016. If you break down this word, it broadly breaks down into two terms. One is transcription, which we have just now taught. And the second one is with this suffix of ohm, which sounds some like, something like genome. And what is genome? Genome is the set of entire DNA, okay, or entire set of DNA in the body. Now, which, which of them is responsible for carrying out the process of transcription? It is not DNA. RNA carries out transcription. So therefore, the entire, the entire set of RNA in the body is known as transcriptome. And this is more micro level study as compared to genome study. So now that you understand what is genome and what is transcriptome, can I now define genome sequencing or transcriptome sequencing for you? It is basically sequencing the sequencing these nucleotides and their arrangement in which manner the AT and GC molecules have been arranged in each and every organism which is basically different for different organisms. This will make us to uncover the genetic information that is present inside them and the variations that are present within diversity. So this process of and of decoding the sequence of nucleotide arrangement in a genetic material of an organism is known as genome sequencing. If you are about to understand the RNA sequencing, then this will be known as the, the transcriptome sequencing. So I hope these concepts, the basic ones are clear to you. Now, we will get into the topic that why is there a need of genome sequencing at all? You can see that there are widely uh, spread studies about genome sequencing and a lot of activities have been performed across the world. There is genome, uh, uh, there is one project which is the Genome 100K project of Asia. There is one for the US, there is one for the world. In fact, in India, there is going on multiple genome sequencing projects. So why is it happening in such a large pace? Because if you understand the genetic makeup of an organism, you will be able to uncover all the mysteries associated with that organism, be it a plant material or be it an animal or be it a human. So first of all, in medical sciences, it will be helping us immensely because it helps us to establish a direct link between the gene and the associated disease. It will tell us that why a particular segment of population is more prone to a particular kind of disease. And this will also help us to uncover the preventions and the cures for some of the genetic diseases, for example, the Pompe disease that we have read previously, for example, thalassemia, for example, hemophilia, such genetic diseases can also be cured and even prevented if we understand this gene and disease linkage. This will also help us to prevent and have better cures of some of the deadly diseases, for example, TB, diabetes, cancer, etc. by understanding if a certain variety or if a certain segment of population is more prone to these diseases and how can we, how can we eliminate it for them. So first of all, it helps us to understand gene and the disease link. Second, if you are able to uncover the entire genetic makeup and the linkages of disease with every particular gene, then you will also be able to advance in the medical sciences and the medical researches by providing and by developing precision medicine and precision healthcare. You will be able to have more targeted diagnostics with respect to each and every sector of population. You will also be able to generate precision medicines which is targeting not just some of the biochemical compounds of the body 
or broadly like cells etc but it will be able to target the genes itself so for example the crispr cas9 technology is nothing but an advent of or one of the inventions of biotechnology once we understood the genome sequencing but this is first of all required in order to carry out any other invention in the field of precision medicine or precision healthcare next it not only helps the humans or the animals with their health facilities but it also helps us with biodiversity management and conservation specifically if you genome the crops or the crop varieties especially the staple ones for example the rice and the wheat which are actually being sequenced very frequently you will be able to understand why certain varieties are performing poorly the other varieties are high on yield this will help you to ultimately enhance the productivity of the farm and this will also help us to double up or enhance the farmers income this will also help us to ensure food security for the nation and this will also somehow help us to develop certain varieties which are more nutritional or having more nutritional content than the others for example the golden rice so it will also help us in crop improvement and eventually in food security then it also helps us in biodiversity conservation and management ever wondered why some of the organisms are going more extinct than the others why some of them are in breeding more than others what are the causes of susceptibility of building a certain virus or certain zoonotic disease inside a particular animal organism bird species etc all of that can be decoded by genome sequencing of the animals so by by having genomic sequencing of the biodiversity you will be able to uncover why let's say the asiatic uh, lions have been developing the canine distemper virus why the inbreeding is causing uh, causing the tigers to appear black in color so all of these susceptibility diseases and how much it can spread across and cause zoonotic disease to humans all of that can also be understood meanwhile we will also try to understand the reasons of their endangerment and therefore provide effective measures for their conservation so it helps multifolds and therefore there is wide wide need and demand of genome sequencing across the world in fact in the case of india itself we have got multiple sequencing miles, milestones the first genome sequencing that was done by india was in the year 2009 that was the first one and 10 years later we were able to uncover the genome sequencing of about 1000 organisms mostly were humans and then and then right after 5 years you can see that we grew enormously in our genome sequencing potential by sequencing about 10000 organisms now multiple government initiatives have been a contributor in the same so it all started with the government aided program of indigen that was pursued by csir and this was done in the year 2019 in order to commemorate the 10 years of the first genome sequenced sample of india that happened in 2009 to commemorate 10 years of the same it was built in order to have a sequencing of 10000 10000 humans across the diversified population of india in order to understand the genetic build up across the diversity of the country then it got further advanced and enhanced by the genome india project which was launched by the department of biotechnology along with collaboration of csir in the year 2020 the genome india project further enlarged the set G- indigen was only supposed to map about 1000 humans but genome india was doing for 10000 ones then we also have got certain genome sequencing projects with respect to crops so icar indian council for agricultural research has been putting monumental efforts for genome sequencing of some of the important crops like rice wheat brinjal cotton etc in india and then there has been wildlife genome sequencing going on uh, as well for example for the endangered species like rhinoceros for example bengal tiger for example our cheetahs etc so these projects will help us to enhance our understanding about the biodiversity what are the potential threats to them by them and this will help us to have better measures to tackle with the biodiversity related challenges now what are the need of regulation the need of regulation is the growing demand of genome sequencing therefore it is pursued by multiple organizations not just the private one but also by the public one and because there is enhancement in the amount of genome data that we are acquiring right now just like any other data we also need to provide data protection to the data to the genetic information that is being extracted out of the biodiversity 
So first of all, the need is to provide laws and regulations for data protection so that such laws would ensure that there is prevention of the misuse and unauthorized disclosure of the genetic information of a person or of an organism unduly. It can be observed and it has been observed in fact that there has been illegal sample export for these genetic informations for the commercial purposes, something which is alarming for the institution, especially for the government. So data protection, data security again of the genetic information is very, very important. The next is to incorporate the regulations which incorporate in them informed consent and the clauses of ethical consideration so that the person who is undergoing research and testing and the clinical trials are actually aware of all the facets of genome sequencing, the benefits of it, the potential risk of the same and therefore he is able to make an aware decision or an informed decision regarding the same. So he should be fully informed that's the first thing and there should be proper ethical values maintained while genome sequencing as well. Next. We should also try to prevent the discrimination based on the genetic information and there should be harsh regulations for the same. See what happens, let's say we have leaked the information, the genetic information or the genetic or the genome sequencing to commercial organizations and now it's with them. Now let's say our insurance companies and the employment agency knows that a person X and a person Y comparing between the two understands that X is more vulnerable to diseases developing some of the genetic disorders or some of the other communicable diseases and therefore denies some of the benefits like insurance services, employment facilities etc to person X. This amounts to discrimination on the grounds of genetic information and this would be the worst case, the worst ever misuse of genetic information available to us. So therefore, there needs to be strong stringent regulation to make sure that such discrimination based on genetic information doesn't take place. Next, to promote equitable access of the outputs that we have acquired out of genome sequencing. See, not all nations are able to process and to calculate genome sequencing of their population and organism because they lack in capacity, because they lack in capital. For example, the low income countries like Africa, but they also deserve to be, to be informed or to be made aware of the product or the resources that are created out of the genome sequencing projects that have been conducted by other affluent countries, let's say by India. So we need to ensure that there is equity and access in the benefit and resource sharing that is coming out of genome sequencing. So this will also help us to address potential biases due to their underrepresentation because it's not possible for us to manage and map the genome of all the populations. The sample set will always be limited. There will be still some amount of population which will be highly underrepresented. So there needs to be justice for them as well. And at the same time, we need to make sure that there is equitable access for, in fact, the lower income countries and the people who are coming from more vulnerable background, for example, the tribers, the PVTGs. Okay, so this is how we will be able to ensure that there is adequate amount of trust built across the stakeholders participating in the genome sequencing projects. And this is how we will make sure that there is accessible and equitable healthcare available to all across the world. We have better measures to prevent the diseases that can be coming that have already occurred in the world. And we will also put up brilliant measures to have more safeguards and more protection for biodiversity and environment. Now, this particular topic has been very, very important for UPSC because time and again, it has been asking questions on genome and on genomics. So can we solve this PYQ of 2017? It says that how can the technique of genome sequencing often seen in news be used in immediate future? So basically asking for the potential applications. As already told you that the things of science and technology, the questions on science and technology, if asked about their potential application, it's actually limitless. So you do not need to think a lot about it unless and until some extreme statement is coming. Let's talk about the first statement. Genome sequencing can be used to identify the genetic marker of disease resistance and drought tolerance in various crops. We've already read that that is why we perform crop genome sequencing. That's absolutely correct. Second, this technique helps in reducing the time required to develop the new varieties because you understand the crops more deeply. So of course, this is also correct. Next, it can be used to decipher can be used to decipher the host pathogen relationship in the crops. This can also be a potential application. So the correct answer is all of the above. And there are multiple other questions on genomics and genome sequencing, which I would recommend that you should also try to attempt. Now, 
coming to the next topic a very important one here we are going to analyze the election commission of india which is in the context that recently an election commissioner has resigned from his post ahead of the lok sabha elections and this actually makes effectively lok sabha the uh, this actually makes election commission a single membered body which now comprises only of the chief election commissioner because they were the other two members the first one was retired in february and the second one has resigned so we will understand the security of their tenure we'll understand the comparative between the powers of chief election commissioner and the other two election commissioners what are what is its constitution appointment clauses what are the challenges faced by them in this article so first of all to begin with election commission of india is an independent autonomous constitutional body which is responsible primarily for carrying out free and fair elections in world's largest democracy according to article 324 of the constitution under part 15 it has directly enumerated the exact functions to be performed by election commission of india which basically is to perform the superintendence direction and control of all the election processes in the india except for the two except for the election processes of municipalities and panchayats why because they are being conducted by the state election commissioners so basically all the election processes of union and states have to be superintended directed and controlled by this body which is election commission of india it was it it was formed in 25th of january 1950 which is also celebrated as national vote national voters day so this is when it was formed the date is important because it can be asked in the prelims anyway now let's get into the body understand the composition election commission originally was a single membered body having only chief election commissioner or only one election commissioner and this happened until 1989 but then an amendment came in the the 61st the 61st amendment of 1988 which enhanced the strength of this body and said that there will be an election commissioner a chief election commissioner and n number of election commissioners as decided by president from time to time so the strength is not actually decided by the constitution though there has been a constitutional amendment which said that it has to be a multi membered body why because of the rising population of the electorates in india initially the population was not that much but in the later uh, decades we uh, we were seeing a huge uproar a huge shout out in the population and therefore we saw that we need to also enhance this body the strength of this body the exact strength is not mentioned in the constitution it is only mentioned that it is going to be a multi membered body and the number of election commissioners will to be de decided by the president of india so who decides the strength the president of india who appoints them again the president of india what is the tenure again the tenure of only chief election commissioner has been defined in the constitution saying that it should be of 6 years up to 6 years or up to 65 years of age whichever is earlier whereas it is not mentioned for the other election commissioners currently the strength is such that we have got one chief election commissioner and the other two election commissioners the other two election commissioners their tenure is again under the discretion of the president so again this is one of the challenges faced by the election commission of india that there is no security of tenure given to the election commissioners also their strength and their appointment is also left under the discretion of the president of india now we will talk about their powers and the security of tenure though there are some variabilities between their tenure and their strength between the chief election commissioner and the other two election commissioners but they enjoy equal powers thoroughly which is equivalent to that enjoyed by judge of supreme court so the powers is equivalent to that of the judge of supreme court so the security of tenure that they enjoy is also equivalent to that of the security of tenure of the judge of supreme court so what is the security of tenure for chief election commissioner he cannot be removed from the office until and unless by the grounds specified for the removal of the supreme court judge again in the case of the other election commissioners they can only be removed from the office and they cannot be removed from the office except by the recommendation of the chief election commissioner recommendation of chief election commissioner now there are multiple functions that are performed by that are performed by this constitutional body 
which takes care of the election processes. The first function, we can broadly divide it into three uh, types of function. One is the administrative function. Administrative function includes preparation of voter list, division of constituency, devising the code of conduct, imposing the model code of conduct, notifying the schedule of the election, scrutiny of nomination paper, recognition of political parties, giving them the symbols, allotting them uh, their party symbols. All of that comes under the administrative functions. The second type of function is the advisory function, where it is responsible for giving advices to the president and the governor respectively for the disqualification of MPs and MLAs respectively. The third broad kind of function is basically quasi-judicial function. It has also got certain judiciary, judiciary powers with respect to exercising control on two things. First of all, on the recognition of political parties, recognition of political parties and second on the allotment of on the allocation or allotment of symbols to them. So on these two genres, on these two subjects, it has got some judicial powers as well. So broadly, we can divide its function into three parts. Now, we will analyze and we will look into the concerns faced by the Election Commission of India. So first of all, is obviously the lack of fixed tenure. Constitution of India doesn't specify the tenure for the election commissioners as we have already seen. So who determines it? It is under the discretion of President of India who doesn't work without the aid and advice of the Council of Ministers. So there are concerns regarding the political interference in their appointment. That is the first concern, the political interference. This political interference also becomes a concern because of the lack of prescribed qualification in the constitution. Constitution doesn't specify any qualifications as to who can become the election commission. There is no age criteria, no academic criteria as well. So therefore, again, it comes under the discretion of president and therefore is susceptible to political interference. Next, they also lack a lot of power, making them effectively toothless in many areas. Yes, they have the right to impose model conduct of model code of conduct during and before the elections, but they do not have the power to penalize somebody who is causing contempt or who's not following the model code of conduct. Then they do have the power to register the party, but they do not have any powers to deregister the party if they follow up any plenary or any criminal activities. Then they do not have the power to cause intra-party democracy or intra-party intra discipline in any in any political party. They do not have powers to regulate finances of the bodies as well, of the political parties, and therefore essentially they are left helpless when it comes to decriminalization of the politics, which is one of the most important problems that needs to be dealt with. The next concern is regarding allegations on the partisan role of election commissioner. It has been alleged that they have generally been found to be providing clean sheets to high profile individuals or to be the party in power. So therefore, it shows that they are not working very impartially, which should be one of the foundational tenets for the working of election commissioner of Election Commission of India. So allegations on partisan rule, this also dilutes the public trust on the credibility of the functioning of election commissions. So it is also a big cause of concern. The other doubt that is put on their credibility is because of the malfunctioning of the election processes. You have been seeing that election, the election voting machines, uh, the EVMs have been tampered too often. The booths have been captured by the political parties and this actually erodes the trust of the people in the election process itself, which actually defeats the idea of democracy and having free and fair election. So these are some of the concerns which needs to be dealt carefully and properly. We should try to not only empower the election commissioner, and the election commission, the body itself, but we also need to empower the democracy by taking the following reforms. First of all, we need to provide constitutional protection to all the members equally. There shouldn't be disparity. If at all we have decided that there, there's going to be a multi-membered body, all of them should be provided equal security of tenure. Next, we should also grant additional powers so that they can be strengthened. Their role can be strengthened in democracy in conducting free and fair election. How can we do that? We can provide them power to impose and to penalize people who are not following the model code of conduct, then powers to deregister the political parties, powers to take action against a person who's causing caste and religion-based campaigning. And this is how we'll be able to discipline the elections 
that are happening in India. Next, we need to improve the EVM security measures so that the trust of the public doesn't get eroded on the functioning of Election Commission of India. Next, we also need to enhance the transparency and accountability by also ensuring transparency in the appointment process. Now, one such measure has already been taken by the government of India. So, as you know that an, an amendment has been made. An amendment has been made in the appointment process where now, President will be appointing on the basis of recommendation that are coming from a selection committee. Now the selection committee will be comprising of three people, Prime Minister of India, a union cabinet minister from the government and leader of opposition. So these three will be giving recommendations and on the basis of their recommendations we will be having, we will be having our election commissioners appointed. So there is some of the other ways in which we are trying to empower the commission but we have a long way to go. So therefore, these are some of the measures which can be taken because ultimately empowering the commission would empower world's largest democracy. In the next topic, we will analyze the privatization of space sector specifically in India. This is a news because recently, a private company Agnikul Cosmos has announced the launch window for India's second privately built rocket. The first one was from Skyroot and second is coming from Agnikul to be launched somewhere in the month of May. Now, let's analyze the status and potential of private sector in India. First of all, according to the Space Tech Analytics, a very prominent organization for carrying out such analysis, it says that India is the sixth largest player internationally when it comes to the overall space tech economy. But the issue is that only 3.6% of the total space tech companies are belonging to India. If we compare it with United States, United States shares a whooping percentage of 56% of the total companies that are working in the space tech sector. They are coming from United States. As compared to India, what is the status in India? Only 3.6%. So do we, we do have a lot of potential, but we are not employing that potential. So the thing is that we are underperforming. Next, there is increasing participation, especially seen in the last uh, decade, because since 2012, it has been observed and this this data has been given by economic survey that over and about 100 companies and startups have built across this direction in, in the field of space tech. So again, we are seeing exponential participation of private sector, which has also called upon some of the regulations and therefore now government is also trying to liberalize the entry of private sector into the space sector of India. Now, according to Confederation of Indian Industries, the total valuation or the total potential of Indian space industry is actually calculated to about $50 billion by 2025, which means it has got immense potential of growing the economy of India and also generating whooping 1 lakh jobs, direct and indirect jobs in the country. So therefore, immense potential is signified again. You can see multiple startups plurring up. Some of the examples can be given like Agnikul Cosmos that is, that is building 3D printed suborbital rocket, Skyroot Space, third stage or three stage orbital rocket, there is Pixel, there is Bellatrix, there is Dhruva space, all of these examples you can incorporate in your mains answers in order to support the arguments. Now what is the need of privatization? The need is that we have immense potential but we are also immensely underperforming. If you see our status, our global share, our share in the global market, we are standing at a low of 2%. So we do not even hold a 2% share in the total global space economy. So therefore, we need, to, we need to build our capacities. How can we do? We can do it by introducing the private sector into the space sector. Now, what are the pros and cons? Let's analyze that. First of all, what are the advantages? The, the best advantage is because of the innovative capabilities and the competitive tendencies of private sector, it will be able to build indigenization in the space products in India, it will be able to build some subsystems or components of the rockets, if not the entire rocket. And this will also ease off the burden of ISRO, who was primarily responsible for building each and everything for the space sector of India. So first of all, this will lead to indigenization of the space products. And because of the competitive tendencies, they will also be able to bring out these subsystems in much competitive prices. So therefore, this will also reduce the overall cost of the operations. Next, it will also lead to technology and innovations. And by the way, if I'm talking about the cost, do you know that Agnikul, when it is producing small satellite launching vehicle, it is 100% less in cost as compared to that produced by ISRO. So that is the impact. Now, 
Talking about the technology and innovation, private sector is known for experimenting more. It's known for being more fearless, therefore it will be able to innovate more. In fact, in the case of Bellatrix, it has been seen. Then it is collaborating with ISRO in order to build, in order to build electric propulsion vehicles. Electric, electrically propelled launching vehicles in India. And this is by Bellatrix. Again, an example that you can give. Next is the investment and capacity development. Now, this can also be done immensely because private sector is known for attracting a lot amount of FDI. Now, because investment is coming, the capital would be coming and therefore a lot of innovations would be made again. It will also help us in capacity development by first of all bringing in the best of the talents across the world because they are getting better prices when they work in private sector enterprises and startups as compared to working in a PSU. Second thing is it also will help us to address some of the infra gaps, for example, providing satellite based uh, web services. So in this direction, OneWeb has collaborated with Bharti Airtel. So this startup will also be working in this direction. It will also help us to fulfill infra gaps, for example, providing launching vehicles and some of the affordable components for the same. So these are the advantages which will make our space sector very competitive and ahead of the race in the global space economy. Then what are the challenges faced by it? Main challenge is the regulatory hurdles. It's not very easy to get the regulatory clearances in the right time. So this will delay the process unnecessarily. This will also demotivate the private players. So regulatory hurdles needs to be taken care of. Also one more issue from the side of government would be that it is not very, it is not very easy to regulate the privatization in space sector. So that also needs to be addressed. Next, there are increased launches because there will be a lot of startups coming over here. Everybody will be trying to deploy their satellites or their services. So this will cause increased number of launches and increased number of overcrowding in the space, which means there will be more pollution, more emission pollution happening. This will have environmental and climatic concerns. At the same time, it will also lead to an effect which is known as the Kessler syndrome. Kessler syndrome is when because there are a lot of there is congestion made by a lot of satellites operating in a particular orbit what happens is they start colliding with each other and when that happens the amount of debris that is produced due to the collision in fact increases more. So this will cause huge debris problem or the waste problem in the space again one of the glooming and rising concerns about the space sector. So there are certain challenges and there are certain advantages for while we try to evaluate the privatization. Then what can we do about it and what are the government initiatives in order to augment the private sector? So first of all, government has revised, the Indian government has revised the FDI guidelines allowing 100%, 100% FDI under government route, which means government approval would be required. It's not under automatic route. And this is to ensure that there is increased privatization across the sectors of the space economy. Next is the commercialization of ISRO's technology. So a PSU has been built, which is completely, it is completely fully government owned. And it comes under the departments of space technology. And this is responsible for basically bringing in all the ISRO technologies and products and selling them to the industries. So this gap will be bridged by New Space India Limited that has been formed in 2019. So it will actually take up all the operational and the commercial functions that were performed by ISRO before. Now the next thing required would be to build an ecosystem which is very integrated, which is bringing together the academia, the industry and also the service providers. So in order to bring all of them together, there needs to be an integrated space ecosystem and the facilitator of these of the same has been the InSpace. InSpace which is launched again as an autonomous body under the Department of Science and Technology and this is an autonomous body working in order to integrate the different players in the space sector. This has been launched in 2020. Then India has also promulgated the India space policy in order to attract privatization across the sectors of space. Again what it does, it basically regulates and demarcates individual functions for for all the space agencies that are working. ISRO demarcated the function for ISRO, demarcated the function for NSIL. NSIL will now take over all the operational function of the ISRO according to this policy. It has also demarcated the function for InSpace. 
and it has also liberalized norms for privatization to a great extent and then government has also shifted from supply based the previous supply based model to the demand based model and who will be the aggregator responsible for noting down all the demands coming across the economies across the countries and then creating a targeted commitment list for the same it will be nsil so nsil will take care of all the demands that are coming and now we'll be creating products in line of the demands that are generated across and for india so this is about this is about privatization of space sector in india and now we will talk about an important place in news in fact a very important protected area this is the kaziranga national park because recently our prime minister has visited over here kaziranga national park as you can see from the map is somewhere over here is basically on the left hand side of the brahmaputra river and where it is it is located in the state of assam now it it was accorded as a national park status in the year 1974 it also is a very important tiger reserve it is also unesco world heritage site of natural kind since 1985 it is very important bird area by recognized by bird life international so you can only imagine the relevance of kaziranga national park and its enormous biodiversity richness talking about biodiversity richness let's analyze the species it is home to world's highest number of one horn rhinoceros you also need to remember one more fact that if i talk about the highest amount of rhinoceros density in india then it is in the pobitora it is in the pobitora wildlife sanctuary kaziranga stands second in this case but kaziranga stands first when you talk about the total number of rhino population it is also one of the largest in fact the largest protected area of assam region of assam state next the other animals includes all the five big beast which is royal tiger asiatic buffalo elephant and also obviously or rhinoceros then it is home to nine of the 14 species of the primates that are found across the indian subcontinent so if a statement comes that majority or maximum of the primates are found in the kaziranga national park the statement do it seems extreme but it's actually correct this is for the primates now which river flows through it it's a tributary of brahmaputra river which is the dhiplu river information about it is not very prevalent in the newspapers and in the google so you have to remember dhiplu river in particular it's also very relevant because national highway number 37 also passes through kaziranga national park so this is about this particular national park okay now we will read about golden langur and then i will ask a question to you whether golden langur is located in kaziranga national park or not and that you have to answer in the comment box okay so our next topic is about again a very important species news and this is the golden langur because latest survey on the primate has been conducted and it has been found that their population has grown making their population up to 7000 so what is google golden langur why is it named so and where is it particularly located and what are the issues that are concerning them so first of all we will understand the golden langur that it is an endemic species endemic species endemic to only two countries in the entire world one is india and second is bhutan and that too the population is heavily localized if you talk about the localization it is localized by four geographical boundaries so if you see the map of india over here you will be able to see that it is prevalent in the state of the western part of assam and in the south foothills of bhutan only in these two nations now if you talk about the geographical boundaries in which its expanse has been limited the the eastern boundary is set by manas river the western boundary is set by sankosh river the northern boundary is set by bhutan's foothills and the southern boundary the northern one is bhutan foothills and the southern boundary is basically by brahmaputra river so majorly it is located only to the west of manas river and it is located basically in the west of assam only and then it is located and it is localized in only this much amount of area so it is a highly localized and a very shy species in fact it's uh, it is also known as the gi golden langur named as golden langur because of the color of the furs which keeps changing it keeps changing with gender it keeps changing uh, with respect to climate or with their age so it turns from white to golden to brown 
but more often and more prominently it's golden in color so therefore this is known as and recognized as golden langur now we have understood where it belongs to how is it recognized you have to understand one more important fact where is it particularly located in india so in india it is found in manas biosphere reserve because it is located in the manas it is located in one of the boundaries of the western bank of the manas river so manas biosphere reserve is there rai mona national park is there and india's first sanctuary focused on the conservation of golden langur is the chakrishila which is located basically in the dubri district of assam so this is about some of the areas in the protected parks concerning the golden langur now what are the threats that are faced by golden langur some of the things that you need to remember for them is that this is not a carnivore species this is a herbivore species and therefore because it mostly feeds on the canopy it mostly lives in the canopy itself it's a very shy animal goes away from the humans in about no time so it is also therefore known as the leaf monkey because it mostly feeds on leaves they are very secretive creatures they have forested habitats only the life span is not specified and what is their conservation status according to iucn it is endangered it's not critically endangered broadly it's endangered what are the threats faced by them first of all is habitat restriction as you can see that they operate in heavily localized areas and therefore what happens they do not have and actually these are the natural boundaries not even man made boundaries so it becomes very difficult for them to expand their population behind beyond a scale also being very secretive and shy species they do not even try to venture out they are not territorial in nature unlike lion and cheetah so therefore they have habitat restriction now the moment you try to encroach or fragment their habitat it directly causes impact to them so habitat fragmentations have been happening in the name of encroachments for taking up settlement heavy deforestation is going on industrialization developments laying up of electrical lines all of them are also causing threat to them next is inbreeding now as you can see that they are heavily localized what happens they generally inbreed within their own species and this also degrades the immunity of any population so inbreeding is also another issue that needs to be dealt with in order to conserve golden langur though assam government has been putting many efforts for the same and it has been successful quite so because the population has also seen a rise so this was about golden langur and now you try to answer the question whether it is present in kaziranga national park or not so this was all about today's discussion hope you have enjoyed it thank you so much and have a nice day